Hi, I'm Alicia. This is Unencumbered, and today we'll be talking about a new book titled Red Lit Theology by Candace Marie Benbow. I'm actually going to do a giveaway, so I'll give more details about the giveaway towards the end of the video. So first, let's talk about what theology is. So theology is actually the study of God. When we think of what standard theology is, we kind of think of white male theologians, and anything else is adjective theology. So it's womanist theology or queer theology or feminist theology. They feel the need to put the adjective on it, but when white males do theology, it's just theology. And what that does is it creates this idea that what white male theologians do is normative, it's the standard, and they don't put any of their perspective into their theology. But when these outside groups do it, then that's when it's adding something to theology. So this was a standard and now they're adding things. So in this book, Red Lip Theology, <laughs> her adjective she chose is Red Lip. And what I love about that is that came out of a conversation that she had with a white male student in the library. He kind of comes up to her and is basically asking her, where do you fit? What's your theology? Are you a black liberation theologian? Are you a womanist theologian? What's your adjective? And she tells him, he, she just comes up with it. She's like, I'm a Red Lip Theologian. And he's just kind of like, wait, what's that? And what I love about that is that she wants to create something of her own and not feel like she has to be put in those categories. And the fact that he felt that she needed to name what her theology is. So when you're a white male doing theology, you can just call what you're doing theology. But if you're a black woman, you need to put a name on it. And so she's very clear and, <laughs> and says it's red lip theology, which I think is just so cool. And so now let's talk about the red lip aspect. So the red lip is, as a red lipstick, is often seen as bold and almost too much sometimes how red lip is seen as sinful you know in church you can wear like muted tones as soon as you wear a red lip that's you're doing too much that's a lot and i think that's basically what her theology is and it's bold and it's a, it's not afraid to say that your definition of what is sinful is not my definition of what is sinful and really bringing to light the beauty and discovering yourself and loving yourself and giving yourself grace. And I think that's that's something that I really appreciate about her. Like she's not making it out to seem like this book, her, her red lit theology is just perfectly systematic and everything connects. And she's not saying that. What she's saying is that this theology is born out of experience. And I'm going to tell you what I've learned and what I know to be true about God. She really does privilege experience in this book. So talking a little bit about like the how that is a womanist move. Um, so womanist theology, a very popular text that comes up is the Hagar narrative. We really focus in on Abraham and Sarah and we kind of forget Hagar. She's just kind of like, oh, well, she's gone. You know, it doesn't really matter. But what the womanist theologians say is that we want to honor Hagar's experience. And what can we learn from Hagar's experience? Dolores Williams in her book, Sisters in the Wilderness, she talks about Hagar and what her experience means for who God is. And so in that story, we have uh, Sarah and Abraham, they are unable to have a child. Sarah has the idea for Hagar, her servant, to give Abraham a child, and that would be raised as Abraham and Sarah's child. So then what happens is Sarah ends up getting pregnant later on in the story, and then she has a child, and Sarah's like, well, we don't need Hagar and this other child here, because it kind of messes up the inheritance and confuses things, so send them out. So God tells hey Abraham, do what Sarah says. So Abraham gives Hagar some materials and sends her out into the wilderness. And so while she's in the wilderness, she gets to a real point of desperation where she doesn't have resources to survive for her and her son. So she puts her son over by bushes and she's like, I can't watch him die. I cannot watch my son die. So she's crying and sobbing and she hears an angel from God and the angel says, like, why are you crying? Like, I'm going to make a nation out of your son here. So then after that, it's like proclaimed over her son. God opens her eyes and she sees a well of water. And she names God. So that's a very important thing that she names God, the God who sees. Um, and in womanist theology, the important thing there is that God didn't deliver her from her circumstances, but gave her resources for survival. And so that's a key for womanist theology. And that's something that I think comes up in red lip theology. In the first chapter, Candace talks very openly about the fact that her mother had her when she was not married. The church asks Candace's mother to go in front of the congregation and to basically say that, you know, this set pregnancy is sinful and that 
you know, I need to apologize to all of you was basically what she was asked to do. So her mother immediately says, I'm not doing this. I'm going to move to a different church. And she talks about how that was very foundational for understanding who her mother was and what she believed about God. So God did not, so she believes that God would not want her to do that. God is not someone who wants you to basically be shamed um, in that manner. From that experience, she gets this idea that she was going to refuse to believe that she was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And this is a, a passage from the Psalms and David says this, and this idea that that would be something, basically what I'll say is weaponized against unwed mothers who are having children, it's just horrible. Um, and to think that she ha had to experience that, and she talks very honestly throughout the book about how church members would often bring that up to her, how that would be like a way to poke fun when her mom was doing really well in the church or even in her outside life, they'd be like, oh, well, you know, you're doing really well, but don't forget that this is something that happened in your past. And in the next chapter, she really talks about how it was difficult for her to understand if God is this man and her father, you know, was not a part of her life, how that image of God as a man made it feel like, well, you know, all guys stick together. And I thought that was like really uh, poignant to point out like how that male image of God can be really damaging for people. So then from that she talks about how that creates this difficulty in the church when we see God as male that we feel like we can't challenge male authority and I think that is so so important and that's why for myself and um, others I love talking to other people about this it's like we really do have to open who open our understanding of who God is and ungendering God is a really great way to do that. So when we talk about God, instead of saying, you know, he, him, to use different pronouns, you know, use she or they. Um, and I think that can be really helpful for expanding who God is. God is bigger than your pastor who is male. God is bigger than that. And talking about the pain of not having your father in her life, she, she talks about how she goes through this journey of recognizing that part of her being alive was a gift from her father and how that really helped shape how she was going to give her father grace in some things um and she talks about how this this idea of grace being like god understands you not being able to fulfill your potential that there are circumstances that are help there are circumstances that are preventing you from fulfilling your potential but at the same time god keeps us accountable so kind of creating that balance between god's grace and expectation and so in our relationships with people, you know, you do give that grace. Like, I understand that there's a reason why you're not being able to fill this role, but also I'm allowed to be upset. I'm allowed to be angry and I can hold those feelings together. In another chapter, God and other helicopter parents, she introduces a different way of understanding the Adam and Eve story. It's usually taught that Adam and Eve, you know, they were in paradise. They were living a great life. God says, obey me, you not eat the fruit from the tree of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, so in the story, Eve eats the fruit. Um, she gives some to Adam. Adam eats the fruit. God's like, Adam, what's going on? Adam's like, oh, well, this woman you gave me told me to eat the fruit, so I ate the fruit. And so then they are banished from Eden. So oftentimes this is taught as this was the first example. This was the first sin. Because of this, um, all of humanity is fallen. And so she takes more of a Jewish view where she wants to talk more about how this it's a learning experience for Adam and Eve. So he's very open with describing God as a parent and saying, maybe God overreacted a little bit. <laughs> and and I, I think that's really interesting because it shows that she's not afraid to say, in this passage, this reaction didn't make sense to me. And I think that's a really bold move. The often move you're afraid to make as Christians. Something that I've noticed when teaching children the Bible is that children are very open to asking questions when they don't understand something being when they're reading this they're like well that doesn't make sense to me i don't understand why god would do that when someone when a kid asks that question we say you know don't ask that or you know you don't worry about it you know god made it work or we try to make a formula and so when we do think of adam and even this formula of as adam and eve are fallen and then all of all of us sin because of adam and eve but we have you know jesus on the cross and jesus takes away all of our sins and so good news and so that does have that creates a formula that's very neat and helpful but what i love about this um that what candace is prevent presenting that a lot of people other theologians have brought up is this idea that what they did 
was a learning experience. And what I like about that is that it helps us understand our own experiences a little bit better. And I love the line she has in here that um, oftentimes when we think about the Adam and Eve story, we're taught that uh, God was testing them. And I love that she, has, she says this, faith is tested through trials and hard times, not entrapment. So when we think about that story, going back to theology being the study of God and who God is, what does that say about who God is? And then think of this understanding of Adam and Eve are, you know, they take, they take the um, fruit and they have this knowledge and this was a decision that they made and then there are consequences to the decision and she likes the language of implications instead of consequences because consequences tends to be negative and then she asks us as readers do we think of adam and eve do we think of them as an integral part of creation or do we think of adam and eve as a sinful worst thing that could possibly happen in creation then she talks about how we often have a hard time trusting ourselves because when we have this story not just specifically adam and eve but i think one of the texts that I often talk to people about is that we often tell people, lean not on your own understanding, you know, Proverbs 3. Lean not on your chin, trust in the Lord with all your heart, um, you know, it goes on. And so how do you deal with not being able to trust yourself? And so you ask this question, reflect on why it seems impossible to trust your own intuition and discernment. And that I think that's something we have to sit with for a minute because when we grow up in the church, we're taught that there's a formula for everything, basically. And if you just stick to the formula, you'll be fine. But sometimes we have to make decisions that are not in the formula. And so we have to have a confidence in our own discernment and a confidence in our own intuition. And um, that's going to be formed by a relationship with God, but it has to be our own as well. So oftentimes when we're like, okay, I'm gonna try to make this decision. Oh, just other example, I'm trying to make this decision about what job to take. Um, you know, there's no text that says, Thou shall be this career. So I have to use my own discernment and decision. And people often say, pray about it, right? So you're praying about it, trying to discern what, you, what you're going to do. And you may, you know, talk to a pastor. And then, but sometimes what will happen is that when the pastor gives their suggestion, that becomes God's will. And what the pastor says is what the pastor says. Yes, it, once again, it can be informed by God, but it's not God's will for you. You should really reflect on how easy it is for us to kind of get confused and it, this is difficult and so you do have to carry those two things together like this is god's will and this is my intuition candace says god understands those ranges of possibilities and choices you can make and god's going to be with you through those decisions that you make she says god gave us lives because god trusts us with them so think about that for a minute how does that make you feel to know that god trusted you with your own life I would love to hear in the comments what you think about this also as she's talking about the adam and eve story she says eating the apple wasn't a mistake but a sign of their capacity and power so then she has a chapter called god made me black and that just that was really touching for me because i think it talks briefly about experiences that i've had as a black christian and she's very honest about the fact that she's not going to say she's not going to put her racial identity behind her uh, Christian or under her Christian identity, that that's not a choice that she feels she needs to make, which I love. Then there's a chapter, Amazing Grace for Side Chicks. And that one is very, very, very honest. And I believe that that is something, especially in a Christian environment, to admit that you were in a relationship with a married man, it opens you up to a lot of critique. The story ends up not good <laughs> with them. So then she brings up the woman caught in adultery and how Jesus responds to her. And she says, it's Jesus's command to go and sin no more. That reminds us we have the capacity to be better than who we have been. So that language of capacity kind of goes back to what she was saying about Adam and Eve. We'll continue on. I've had many conversations about whether love can be sin. I don't think so. The sin Jesus asked the woman caught in adultery to abandon is whatever enables her to believe and act differently than what she now knew to be true. She was worthy of full, whole, and complete love. When we've healed those parts of us, we can't go back and do as we did before. I would have loved to hear more about that conversation about love as sin. I think that definitely could have been developed a little bit more, but then she, she, got it, she gets to this idea that grace is there for us. And she describes grace on the next page. Grace does not bind 
us to who we have been or shield us from taking accountability for the pain we cause. But it provides us with second, third, fourth, and a hundredth chances to become better people. Grace comes with a reminder, God did not leave us where God found us, but extended the opportunity to learn and unlearn behaviors for a better next time. And she says from that understanding of what grace is, she was able to notice the brokenness in that partner that she had. In the next chapter, We Shall Be Womanist, what I really liked about that chapter is that she talks about what it's like to be a woman in academia and learning new things and coming up with new concepts and then kind of bringing those back to your home church or in your parents. And she talks about how her mom was often like, you're doing too much. Like you're on Facebook having these conversations with people and you're, you're not actually caring about the person, you're caring about putting your idea out there. Her mother says, she's aware of sexism exists in the church, but in order to have that conversation, you can't pour gasoline on a fire and expect it to go out. So she described how her mother, her and her mother had very different ideas of how to deal with people. Her mother had a very high view of people. And so her mother always talks about, you know, you don't wanna push people away, you wanna bring them in. I think it is a reminder for myself as someone who has studied the Bible and theology is that I don't know everything. And when I'm having these conversations with people about the Bible and theology, I do need to show grace. I need to show humility and really just try to think about, are there times when I've been throwing gasoline on fires when I should have been talking and trying to put them out in other ways? So then in the chapter survived by a special friend, she talks about how she really dealt with having benevolent homophobia. Benevolent homophobia, I think the best way to describe it is the concept of love the sinner, hate the sin, which I completely do not agree with. And I will link my video here about my experience in becoming an affirming Christian, how that is a journey that Candace talks about and how she remembers like being in a situation where she would be the person that um, accountability partner for people like oh, yeah I've been struggling with same-sex attraction will you keep me accountable and not do this type of thing and she talks about how ridiculous it was because she was being this accountability partner praying over people but then she was having sex and she was like that didn't really make sense for me to do so I think that I mean anytime we admit our journey and explain like yeah like I did some very harmful things to people I think that is helpful the next chapter black lace teddies and other pieces I rock under the anointing probably one of my favorite chapters in the book because it clearly addresses soul ties, um, our sex obsessed Christian culture. So in the chapter, she talks about how she basically associated the shame with premarital sex based on what other people taught her to believe about it. And in her heart, she had a different belief. So I think one of the most challenging things in being a Christian is trying to discern is the uncomfortability I have about this thing, the situation, because I feel shame based on what I grew up believing, or is it because I truly believe that what I'm doing is against God's will? Um, she also has this really funny thing about how we say we lose our virginity when we all know where it went. <laughs> I just think that's hilarious. Um, and then also with that, just that idea of losing our virginity, I saw this tweet that said, and said we should call it our sexual debut. <laughs> and I think that's really cute. <laughs> it's like, there shouldn't be loss, losing your virginity when you have loss associated with it. It just makes it this negative thing. But back to the chapter. Um, what I loved about it was that she, again, back to what theology is, theology is the study of God. And so she asked herself, when we talk about soul ties, what does that say about who God is? And she's very clear about when we say soul ties, basically, as something so if you don't know what soul ties are soul ties is this idea that if you have sex with someone you are tied to them for eternity they will always be connected to you and you don't want to have multiple soul ties you're only supposed to have one soul tie and that's supposed to be with your husband or your wife that's the idea of soul ties so she interrogates this idea by saying it doesn't make sense to me that there could be something that to, connects two people in a very damaging way um and the, in the definition of what people who believe in soul ties say you know the something that connects two people that god cannot unconnect and then she talks about i think this is probably one of the most damaging things about when we talk about virginity and we talk about sex in the church is that she talks about how there's this performance women in these white gowns and they're performing and they're like the virgins 
And she, she had this moment of thinking, you know, once you lose your virginity, you lose a special connection to God. And that's just not true. I think it's important that we take that shame away. Another claim that she makes is that we shouldn't be learning about sex from Leviticus and 1 Corinthians, that we should be learning about sex from human sexuality and human psychology. And I think this is a very interesting point because I think this is something that a lot of people, when they have disagreements with her, it's typically about this aspect of her theology. Um, because people want to have this very formulaic um, understanding of theology because it makes it easy and when theology is messy it makes us unhappy. When you come to a text like hers and you're reading through a certain lens of the bible you're going to be like everything she's saying is unbiblical and this section just does not and she's kind of like well, okay well, that's you <laughs> but I know from experience what works. I know from experience what's life-giving. I know from experience what has helped me feel God's presence and feel God's love and that theology that I grew up with was damaging and unhelpful. I tried to make myself believe what the church said about sex but it never took because reducing God's delight or disappointment in me to whether or not I had sex just seemed very very dumb. I believe our sexual agency should honor who God created us to be. This is why I don't believe premarital sex is inherently sinful. To me, any intentional act meant to disrupt our flourishing and block our light from within us is what is sinful. So I would say that's her definition of sin. And so I think this would be something interesting to discuss. So what do you think about that definition of sin? Is it too simplistic? Is it too complex? Is it too vague? Is it too open? Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. In the next chapter, she talks about her experience leaving the church and how that was helpful for her in finding God again and connecting with God um and I experienced that you know I left from one of my home church and that was a really difficult experience I'll do a video on that at some at some point <laughs> um and yeah I think I think that that experience in itself can be life-giving because when you leave toxic things that are going on in the church and you're able to kind of get out of that environment it opens you up to new possibilities and understanding who God is and then the last chapter, it's called Psalm 90 verse 12 and Psalm 90 verse 12 reads, So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. She talks about how her faith has been informed by the experiences she's had in her life and especially her relationship with her mother, which was just really beautiful. As I was reading, I felt like I knew her mother. Um, it was just beautiful, beautiful tribute to her. And I do want to read her definition of faith at the end. So she says, But the fearlessness faith calls forth is a kind that leads us to believe. If we get up and face the sun and put one foot in front of the other, those steps will eventually open up paths of healing and more life. And fearlessness requires you to be honest about the things causing those steps to be harder than they need to be. It is courage to name the ways that the church and religious doctrine have been our stumbling blocks. I love this passage about faith. Because that's something I really want to do in this channel is to be honest about the ways that faith has been made hard because of our experiences in the church. But then also talk about how God is with us and each day we are taking a step towards healing and life. And I just love that as an ending reflection. So I hope you've enjoyed this review of Candace Bimbo's Red Lip Theology. If you're interested in entering to win a copy of this book, um, just remember to be subscribed to this channel like the video and then leave a comment about something that was meaningful to you. I think you should definitely go out and get your own copy of Red Lip Theology because I think it'll be a beautiful life-giving read for you. As always, you are loved, you are affirmed. Stay on encouraged.